Hello, everybody. Welcome to Women in Crypto, where we discover the future of money, markets, and payments, and meet the leaders in the new digital economy. And today, I'm so excited to have our guest, Dr. M, with us. From She's the president of Impact Institute of Digital Economy, and also she is working at, with Singularity as the chief alchemist. So welcome, Dr. M. Hi, Lori, and thank you so much. We've been planning this for a while, and I'm so happy we managed to have this conversation. Uh, my name yes. is Mihaela Uliero, but as you can imagine, I don't want to torture anybody <laughs> forcing <laughs> them to say my name, and as such, Dr. M is the shortcut. So, okay. uh, <clears throat> yes. Thank you so I'm, much for being here, and we're looking forward to, to hearing what you're doing over there uh, to tell us a little bit about Impact Institute of Digital Economy. Yeah, so the first thing, you know, impact stems from innovation management and policy accelerated with communication technologies. So it wow. is a mouthful anyway, yes, <laughs> but, it is. but uh, this I think says and spells out uh, my passion you know, which ranges from governance to, to better policies. And how can we do that for the economy within mm -hmm. the digital realm? So it's really, uh, therefore, kind of blockchain is the keyword there. And, and it's a very good mechanism to, to uh, set it up. Because so Impact actually is, uh, has started in an organic way from my work as a scientist and a research chair. So I held the research chair in East Society and I was thinking how to redesign our social structures to make them more effective, more engaged, to catalyze action in the direction which is maybe more fruitful for society than the fake news and the quarrels which we have on social right. networks and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, and, and to, to have impactful uh, action in the world, which will make the world better. And that's when uh, the need for advising and for uh, alchemy <laughs> and strategic partnerships uh, came to the fore. And as such, I started this consulting, the Impact Institute for the Digital Economy. Besides this, I have uh, about 200 or more publications on the topic of the society. And, uh, and that's what uh, this kind of work brought me to the world of blockchain as well. I assume wow. our conversation will revolve uh, yeah. about blockchain because I know uh, <laughs> you, you, what you are doing now. <laughs> yes. Quite a bit. So tell us a little bit about one of your papers that uh, <laughs> produced um, a lot of your advising? Yes, uh, there's many of them, obviously, from 200. It's unfair because they are all my babies. And you know, oh. when you write the paper, it's the result of uh, <laughs> a research, which is kind of deep research and deep tech. So it is like a birth giving. And now you're, <laughs> you're, you're asking me to... <laughs> <laughs> to choose one, one baby. I <laughs> will. I will. And this is called organic governance. Okay. So this organic governance uh, paper is, uh, is looking at how we can actually uh, redesign our governance structures from, to, to shift them from the top-down counterproductive uh, uh, structures to the bottom-up more organic ways of doing things. And, uh, and I invite everybody, if you Google my name and organic governance, or maybe even if you Googled only organic governance, you will find my paper. And so um, this has also led me to, uh, you know, better management and, and, you know, so it all boils down to individual sovereignty and how to self-govern when putting the individual at the center. And this, you know, from here, all the other things are stemming better data, governance, privacy, and so on and so forth. So I ended up to work uh, at Consult with the World Economic Forum, data-driven development. So, you know, once you have publications out there, people find them, and then they come to you, and they ask, we want this and that. Can you advise us for this and that? And then I realized I will not have much time for teaching anymore. So I had to uh, step out of academia, at least full-time, I couldn't handle anymore and I chose to advise. So oh, wow. yes. <laughs> wow. And so um, let's go to the subject of blockchain since it is changing a lot of the social structures. And, yes. uh, and I like what you said about instead of top down, uh, the orga organic 
um, governance. So if somebody's looking at sovereignty or self-sovereignty, how can blockchain influence that? Yes. <laughs> so there, there's, there are two words which I can call, and this is economic identity which is the economic sovereignty. So first of all, I am the master of my own money. Yes, I can, I can start with that. I create a wallet and then I'm in control. At last, you know, it's not the bank. I don't need approval from anyone to send you <laughs> some Bitcoin. <laughs> and uh, right. such economic sovereignty, economic identity is, uh, is number one, which, which blockchain gave uh, to the world. And then from there, once we start with the individual versus imposing either a middleman or someone who has to approve what I do, then it all can start to re be reconfigured. So I will give you actually this uh, example, which I think maybe people can relate uh, more to uh, from a, a, let's say, practical perspective. So I, maybe many of, I'm sure many of your listeners heard of Burning Man, this uh, movement. Yes. Well, uh, Burning Man started as a movement which was against uh, how society is working now. So let's say if we are to read design the rules of the game. How would we do it better? So let's go in the desert and, and try an experiment. <laughs> so people went there thinking that, okay, total sovereignty. I can do whatever I want. I don't have anyone tell me what to do. Right. And then a few things happened which were not really what they expected. Like, you know, people got drunk and they drove in the night and some people got killed. So then kind of a law and order emerged there. So they... Um, uh, kind of, you know, uh, the principle so emerged and this emergence is like, it just appears when it's needed. So the 10 principles of Burning Man appeared organically. In parallel with that movement, me being a researcher and a professor and having this uh, uh, e-society research agenda, I was doing simulations in uh, cyberspace with, you know, people simulated as software objects and so on and so forth, like a video game, if you want, SimCity or so. And in those simulations, I also kind of simulated how would this, uh, let's say we, we have a, something to accomplish. So how would the community self-organize to accomplish that task? Mm -hmm. And from those simulations, I ended up with very similar rules and principles like the Burning Man. Wow. So actually that exactly, and you can deploy that via blockchain because blockchain is keeping your identity. And then we also have this eco economics that is driving everything behind it. Sure. So, so it is, um, it is uh, yeah, amazing. Of course, there's much more to say and it's right. kind of technical in a way, but on the other side with the Burning Man, uh, the, we, uh, we also released uh, a book called From Bitcoin to Burning Man and Beyond. The oh, question, really? Yes. <laughs> wow. So if you read that book, yeah, you know, your, your listener can really get it and grasp it because Burning Man is a real life experiment, yes? Sure. Bitcoin, uh, also a real life experiment, but it's done digital. So yeah. it's like now you unleash in the world this, uh, this digital opportunity for economic identity and for sovereignty and what will come out of that. Wow. And so the book is, called, is subtitled The Quest for Sovereignty and Identity in a Digital Society. Oh. So it it's all revolves around this sovereignty and economic identity. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And do the principles then revolve around morals and ethics yes among others of the yes individuals. absolutely yeah. absolutely so, so base, you know like gifting uh, uh, leave no trace uh, radical self-expression uh, radical sovereignty but also cooperation so it is they they revolve around that but also are trying to balance Mm. Radical sovereignty with the need to cooperate and to we are social animals, obviously, and in order to succeed, we need perspectives and, and exp experiences and, first of all, yes, respect the others. So right. it is a very beautiful uh, combination, all the 10 principles uh, which your, leader, your readers can find if they Google Burning Man principles. <laughs> I don't need to, to list them here. Yeah. They, they must, and they all speak to that balance between autonomy and cooperation. So you're not totally 
subjugated to the society that imposes on you their views. You are sovereign and it's possible to do both. So those principles are encompassing it all. And uh, maybe Amazing. some of your listeners will have an opportunity <laughs> once the world opens up again <laughs> to experience the Burning Man experience as well. Besides, of course, it's with the Bitcoin. We, <laughs> we don't need to travel anywhere. <laughs> so. Right. Well, and now everything's digitized. So maybe there'll be a, a, a Zoom yes. uh, Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> it was already. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. It was, was virtual. So. Wow. Uh, so how did you get started in blockchain? Uh, yeah. So, so it was very natural. Exactly. Well, when blockchain started, I already had this... Uh, uh, all the research done and all the concept, concepts there. So I actually, I, my research, uh, my specialty is distributed uh, intelligent systems. So distributed was already on my agenda. So from distributed manufacturing to distributed societies. So I uh, simulated a lot of uh, mechanisms and mechanics uh, at various levels. Uh, and especially the governance and the planning around those for different than from supply chain to how do you organize uh, let's say a shop floor work or or uh, in a uh, store here yeah exactly or healthcare and so on yes so so all this uh, all this work uh, of course has to be done on an infrastructure that enables these decentralized distributed systems, which is not the same decentralized as distributed, but of course you have to start with decentralized first right. because everything was centralized. Correct. So I have those in, the, in all my publications, you can find those uh, architectures. They were more complex, much more complex than what Nakamoto came up with in this beautiful, when he brought up all these technologies, to, to create the first blockchain. So immediately when the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain occurred, I, I was already, I mean, I knew many of the people who developed and who uh, invented it, having worked with them. Yeah. It's very similar story also with Singularity Net, as uh, you can imagine, because they are scientists. And so we met at conferences and so on and so forth. Now, and then they did put artificial intelligence on blockchain. So blockchain came like something very natural to me. So I started when it all started, okay. <laughs> when, when it appeared, yes. Wow, so one of the originators of the concept of decentralized and distributed. Yes, wow. yes, I can say that, of course, it is a... <laughs> a, a consortium, yeah, uh, yes. several people, but you, you're exactly. right there. And, and we called it the foundation for intelligent physical agents as a consortium. So you found exactly the right word, what, what it was. And we yeah. considered it as physical agents because we were thinking first, you know, robotics, manufacturing, how can you model those, but also societies like real people, yes, physical agents. And then it all kind of uh, mashed into simulations and more virtual ways of doing things, you know, and, and products which are digital and... Uh, and, yeah, and so on and, and so forth. That's wonderful work. And now, what is it, 12, 13 years later, did you think that it would be as far as it is, or did you think it would be oh my God. further yes. along? When I'm going back, when it all started, when, you know, so we were, we were even in, uh, in these underground retreats, I have to tell you. Yes, so, okay. so I, uh, I have been working with uh, pioneers on the ground <laughs> so we were yeah. meeting without nobody anybody knowing why because uh all these uh, institutions were against us they were afraid what is going on we're gonna jail you uh, you, you want to you know change yeah. money or <laughs> sabotage us so so ripple actually the baby ripple Yes, when mm -hmm. they appear, now they are big companies, successful, and there are many others, which yeah. I, uh, I've been involved with, but they were part of our first retreat. And oh. as a result of that retreat, we had this uh, book, which I mentioned to you, From Bitcoin to Burning Man, but also we had actually uh, developed and wrote a so-called manifesto of okay. this decentralization, which can be found as well, and it is also in the book. Uh, so we, we actually... Of course, our dream yeah, was so aligned 
of, of having a better world and this in a decentralized way that we all we wanted was we we wished that it will happen so i right. it's hard to say that if i anticipated 13 years or so but what i can tell you is that we fought for companies like ripple and and similar ones not, not rather than being jailed to become successful <laughs> and so so i remember we we wrote uh, letters uh, to the treasury department and you know to other institutions here to let them be <laughs> and moreover uh, and believe it or not the the Mavericks at the MIT Media Lab were involved with us. So we invited uh, Sandy Pentland, who is uh, one of the co-founders of uh, the MIT Media Lab, uh, at the retreat. And as a result of that, he encouraged uh, the MIT, the creation of the MIT Bitcoin Club, in which through grants, he gave students free Bitcoin in wow. order to play with them and, and do experiments and see what's going to come up with it. And believe it or not, several successful companies came out of uh, that. Like Circle is one of them. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's, wow. uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so we definitely believed in it. Scientists yeah. believed in it. MIT believed in it, you know, <laughs> until we got to the government to believe in it. And now they are thinking about it quite seriously for many reasons, CBDC, but also for reasons of competition, yes. And oh, also yeah. for reasons of need, like with the voting, yes. So the postal of US postal, postal office has, has a patent uh, on voting on blockchain, which enables everybody now to vote in a safe way, safe manner versus yeah. staying in the long lines, which can endanger some people's lives, especially if they are a bit older. Today, yeah. So let's talk about that because uh, with yes. the time of year we're in, with the voting system, uh, yes. the patent uh, you mentioned from the U.S. Post Office. Or, yes. So tell us what that means for voters and why is that different than what we have been doing with mail-in ballots? Yeah, definitely. So that is very different and it's not the only pattern. There are many companies which are actually doing that. And uh, so last evening I was uh, involved in a, in a conversation with VOTAS, V-O-T-A-S, which is a private company which is deploying blockchain. But with the U.S. Postal Office, obviously, it's, it, it's a much more direct, that's why I mentioned it. It's a much more direct connection, I mean, versus mailing in which your letter can arrive too late. <laughs> it can never arrive. You have no control of, about that. It can just disappear. The mailboxes can just be taken physically True. Yes. Uh, away. <laughs> so now you can do this electronically. And this is exactly what uh, Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain and any blockchain uh, enables. So number one, it enables you to have an identity, a verifiable identity on blockchain. So if I have, so I can, yeah, so this can be done in, in many ways. So I can connect, uh, let's call it uh, Bitcoin address or wallet okay. address, however you want to call it, but for yeah. maybe for your audience, yeah, they would understand easier, with a photograph of my, uh, myself. Like now I can take a photograph and at the same time connect it to a, a, an address, uh, okay. a wallet address. So that is my uh, digital identity which cannot be changed because it is on blockchain now. Okay. And with that identity, I can vote. And so in order to vote, I can set uh, various parameters and the uh, voters to be listed electronically. And once I cast my vote, that is also encoded and registered and recorded as an immutable record on the blockchain. So it cannot be changed by anyone else but Let's say I vote today and until November, you know, when uh, the election date uh, is over, <laughs> nobody can vote afterwards, let's say. Right. When the deadline, until the deadline, maybe I just changed my mind. Maybe some information about my favorite candidate was revealed at the last minute. And then I, that uh, system will enable me also to change my mind before the deadline. Okay. So that is all enabled through so-called smart contracts which right. are, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, giving results which are immutably recorded on blockchain if something is changed, but it yeah. enables me to change my information. And that is all done from my computer or my phone. So very different. 
it remains there, it is immutable, and it, uh, according to, to the properties of blockchain, it is definitely much safer <laughs> and much yeah. more trustworthy, trustless, as, as trustless, they call it yes. in and, our world. Yes. Yeah. So uh, right now, this year, we have the, the ballots that have shown up in the mail and, uh, you know, for early voting uh, ballots. Now, what about the, this patent? Will this come into effect for only people who are using the technology today or does it all <laughs> roll out to people yes, next year? I know, and I totally <laughs> understand you. I'm all with you. This is a problem is a patent doesn't mean that the product is already accepted. Right especially exactly. in a yes. government yes so this is unfortunately not for this year yeah. <laughs> i mean this year the patent was revealed at yeah. least to show the world that it is possible and mm -hmm. also to give them an opportunity to adopt it however right. as you know they're moving slow unfortunately it's uh, although you know i'm working with the congressional blockchain caucus and we have uh, several representatives uh, which are supporting this uh not all of them are so open-minded <laughs> and yeah. uh, as such uh, it's not available for this election yeah this is a yeah. uh, long story short <laughs> um, well, i hope it's not doesn't come like a big disappointment <laughs> but i mean we were not surprised because yeah we've been <laughs> as you say since 13 years or more right we've been around, it so. takes a while for adoption uh of technology yes. to integrate into old it systems or applications for which it's really burning i mean now with covid i would have expected yes now they realize that it's needed right it makes sense <laughs> really yes, a lot yeah amazing amazing so so what's one of the um other projects you're working on or the latest project that you're working on yes so so one of them which is also extremely exciting and speaking of sovereignty yes this yes. is called the sovereign which is a sovereign uh, money the first digital money on blockchain. And uh, it was adopted already two years ago by the Marshall Island. I think maybe this is kind of well-known news. Yes? So okay. I'm an, an advisor. I'm on the board, actually, uh, of the SOV Foundation, which wow. has on board uh, several luminaries, among which uh, Peter Ditus, who was the uh, general manager of the Bank of International Settlement. Okay. And he actually, while he was there, he wrote a book called Revolution Required. <laughs> he realized that money is uh, they are dealt with now. <laughs> it's not the way to do it. Right. So he stepped down from his uh, job and he became the chairman of the SOV Foundation and is working with us now on releasing this first digital currency of blockchain. This is so exciting for me as a project because yes. it's changing the world in many ways. And it's also improving the lives of people who were carrying their money so far on boat. So cash on boat. <laughs> they didn't have any other way. So really, really needed from cash on boat to, to imagine digital wallets this is quite right. a huge uh, huge shift sure so, so yeah so this is uh, this is a project which excites me a lot and uh, so we are now you know in a very advanced stage of releasing this money oh, to the marshall exciting. islands but also of course many other uh, as they are called central bank digital currencies uh, so they are interested in our solution and we are talking to them now Wow, that is an exciting project. So uh, it would yes. be considered a CBDC. Yes. Uh, and uh, would that also be um, attached to any one country or is that going to be a globalized concept? It is, uh, no, the sovereign is uh, the currency of the Marshall Island, which is a sovereign country which has UN status. So okay. it is already, it's been okay. approved by their government. Okay. So what I was saying about uh, it is uh, the solution is being eyed right now by other countries as well. Yes, so, yes, yes, that's great. And um, so what do you see uh, <coughs> the, the blockchains? I know that a lot of the, um, the banks are looking at the XRP blockchain, which is off of the Ethereum blockchain, right? Uh, or no, XRP is really similar. Yeah, is really called, similar. Yes to ethereum uh, so, so we see that and um 
do you lean towards certain blockchain creations uh, with the Ripple or Ethereum when it comes to smart contracts? You mean for the sovereign? Yes. Yes, no, of course there are several candidates. And of sure. course, I love all of them. I mean, what can I say? Yes, the more <laughs> the merrier. It's just how I envision the world in the future is like a symphony of blockchains. <laughs> that's so, right. And they all communicate. That's, that's, <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, a symphony of interoperable blockchains. And we will get there, I hope. I think yeah. the more innovation, the better. The more blockchain solutions, the better. For yeah. the Marshall Islands, you know, and that we are in, a, in this... Uh, uh, let's call it decision problem now. Which yeah. one, yes, to, to deploy on? So we were thinking exactly, uh, as you mentioned, about Ethereum. Right. Then Algorand, I don't know if you know about Algorand. Oh. It is a very, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, first of all, it's again, have been invented at MIT, which is uh, by Professor Silvio Micali, who is a Turing Award winner. I mean, really, he, this, wow. uh, he got so many awards, and he is also a colleague of mine on the Soft Foundation. So I am just, you know, so proud to drink from sure. the fountain of greatness. Exactly. <laughs> Such luminaries. Yes. And so, so now, uh, Algorand is a very performant uh, blockchain and, and very well suited for... Uh, financial uh, services. Therefore, we are considering it uh, very seriously for this project as well. Oh, that's good. So, you know, as much as we want to be open, but maybe for other projects, we may consider other blockchains. Right. So it's, uh, they are all mushrooming and, and improving every day. So coming <laughs> to the fore with a lot of solutions. <laughs> exactly. So we are open and we want to stay open. And also to, to enable uh, various partnerships between various blockchains and solutions. Because uh, through partnering, we can conquer. Because some, maybe some blockchain offers one solution, let's say a better identity solution. Another one maybe have better speed. And if we bring them together, we, we obtain this economic identity at, uh, let's say, light speed, <laughs> which is what we all want. And right. Maybe, without uh, any fees, fee-less transactions. So, yeah. you know, uh, in order to achieve the ideal, you sometimes need to bring more solutions to, to the fore. Yeah. That would Absolutely. be my answer. It's not like uh, this blockchain versus the other. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> it's we the same open. technology, just there's so many different uh, productions right uh, now. And I would say uh, as a technology, if you regard blockchain, like the word blockchain as a technology, you can say, yes, it's the same technology. So, so but from technological implementation perspective, they, many of them are very different. You know, and I don't want to go into those details. No. So as a deep tech, this is not a deep tech <laughs> podcast. <laughs> no, no but that's yes. all right. Yeah. As, as I would say more as a, let's say, uh, decentralization perspective. Yes, they all are, are achieving the same. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're actually over there in Washington right now. And do you see yes. a lot of uh, buzz with the Congress uh, considering blockchain or, or the laws with cryptocurrency? Yes, definitely. And, you know, so uh, I've been involved also with the Government Blockchain Association, speaking of government. Uh -huh. and with the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. And so, so uh, you know, from driver's license in Arizona, which their representative was kind of, you know, ready to deploy, to other identity solutions. And uh, so we had uh, most, the most recent uh, involvement was uh, just before the uh, COVID uh, stroke, you know, it's like really in March of this year, we had uh, a meeting on the future of money organized by the Government Blockchain Association. It's a Congress right behind me. You can see it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was amazing, an amazing meeting. You can still, uh, it, everything was recorded and it is online. So the conversation is very active. We are planning now the, the next meeting uh, in the March of next year in person. Let's hope we can make wow. it. Let, let's see how the world will evolve. Yeah. But in any case, the plan is to have this uh, meeting again as soon as possible and to continue the conversation for many, many applications uh, that, as you mentioned, yeah, from electronic health records to better privacy to, uh, yeah, to, to the CBDC, to the digital dollar, which yes. is now course on everyone's lips <laughs> so. it is it is so uh is there anything you can share with us uh, i know the banking for all act that uh came under the cares act 
um, with the introduction of the digital dollar, is there any uh, new information on that that you well, can share for with us? Well, I mean, it's it is more or less a project, yes. Yeah? So, so in which uh, uh, all the alternatives are being considered, including, of course, the competition and and and. And what are the risks of not doing it practically? I think that's the main conversation. Mm -hmm. So, so from my side, I mean, it is uh, they're moving too slow. This is all I can say. Yes, and, yeah. and the former chairman of CFTC, he is leading uh, this uh, study. Let's call it a study because obviously he knows how the system, how slow the system is. Yes. So they want to put all the processes in place to be successful and not to risk, obviously, to risk with people's money. We are going through a similar process with the Marshall Islands, although the population there, like 50 million people, 50,000 people, sorry. It's so much I mean, smaller. It's nothing, yeah. yes, so it's a perfect sandbox. But still, we can destroy their livelihoods if our blockchain will, and solution will not work. Right. I imagine if this would happen for the dollar, let's say, oh, let's do the, the digital dollar, and then technologically it's not working, or something happens and, and the phone is hacked and everybody is losing their money. So right. these are not easy uh, problems. Yeah. Therefore, they require their time. So that's what the project is doing now. The digital dollar project is investigating all the possibilities and more of a risk analysis to find the right pathway to success. Yeah, yeah. Well, and there's a lot of change happening with uh, uh, a lot of retail, not accepting cash or coins right now. So that's even uh, uh, yes. even more reason. The need to... is even even bigger. Agree. Totally yeah, agree. Yeah. Wow, lots of changes we for have. Us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Lots of changes going on in the world. And uh, thank you for being such a leader in uh, the digital economy and uh, sharing what you're working on. Uh, Actually, yeah. this one, yeah, with the digital dollar and the sovereign are the, really the epitome of the digital economy, right? They what really point? are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's really nothing else to talk about. You know, uh, so many people, you know, have their opinions on, on what that means and what that's going to do for society. But uh, it, will ch it will create some changes. Uh, that's for sure. So, definitely. De definitely. Yeah. Well, Dr. M, thank you so much for being on the show today and sharing your information and projects. And uh, we're glad to have you here as an expert. And uh, Thank you so much, Lori. Such a pleasure. It's a delight. Yes. Definitely. Always it's, talking to you and especially now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining. And everybody, thank you for tuning in today to Women in Crypto. We'll see you online. Bye-bye.